In this section, I'll cover the external morphology of insects. Many people do not distinguish between the terms morphology and anatomy. Anatomy is strictly the form of external and internal body parts. Morphology includes the functions of the organs and relationships of body parts between organisms. As in most of the biological sciences, a knowledge of the morphology or forms of an animal or group of animals is essential for the studies in behavior, physiology, ecology, and taxonomy. Many beginning biologists begin to roll their eyes and sigh when told that they should study the morphology or anatomy of animals. Part of this reluctance is that morphology requires the learning of many new terms. Knowledge of insect forms is important because all insects are derived from the same basic body plan. All have the head, thorax, and abdominal tagmata or body regions. The head has paired appendages that are used for sensing the environment and for eating. The thorax has the three pairs of legs and most adult insects also have two pairs of wings. Both of these are used for locomotion. Orders of insects have specific modifications of the tagmata and appendages which are used to help define those orders. Knowledge of the terms used to describe these modifications helps when using taxonomic keys, and the modifications often give us clues as to the functions that each appendage performs. The grasshopper has been used for decades as the typical insect for morphological studies. Because of this, we'll use the grasshopper too. In this illustration, we can see the three tagmata, the head, thorax, and abdomen, as well as some of the major appendages or structures. We can see the antennae, compound eyes, three pairs of legs, and the wings. Black and white illustrations often do not adequately show the actual structures. So we'll use this picture of a lubber grasshopper that is found in Florida. Notice that this grasshopper has short wings and it cannot fly. The bright colors are warning coloration that tells predators that this grasshopper has been eating poisonous plants and is not good to eat. We can digitally remove the background and the left side appendages so that we can see the individual appendages more clearly. After removing the thorax and abdomen, we can better show many of the structures that make up the typical insect head. The head capsule has a pair of antennae that are used to sense chemicals, air movement, and vibrations. The compound eyes can form a rather crude image that is especially adept at detecting motion. The ocelli are sometimes called simple eyes, and insects can have three, two, or no ocelli. The head capsule has the top area called the vertex, the side or cheek areas is called the gena, and the front is called the frons. The mouth parts consist of a front flap, the labrum, which is attached to the clypeus. Under the labrum are the paired mandibles that perform most of the chewing functions. These are followed by a pair of maxillae that help manipulate food within the mouth. The back flap of the mouth is the labium that was apparently paired appendages but have now been joined together. Both the maxillae and labium have finger-like palps that are used to sense chemicals. We'll go back to using an illustration again for the grasshopper mouth parts. In this image, we see the front of the head with all the parts assembled and below we can see the mouth parts removed and separated. Notice that the labrum is a simple flap that covers the front of the mouth parts. Notice that the labrum is a simple flap that covers the front of the mouth parts. The mandibles have complicated teeth for cutting and grinding of food. The maxillae are often very complicated structures. The grasshopper maxillae have two structures for pushing food around in the mandibles, an outer flap and the palps. 
The labium serves as a back flap and is loaded with all kinds of chemoreceptors for taste organs. The side view of our leopard grasshopper thorax reveals a very complicated structure and many of the subunits are difficult to determine or are obscured by other structures. The basic insect thorax can be viewed as a box-like structure that has top plates called nota, side plates called pleura, and bottom plates called sterna. Since there are three segments to the insect thorax, we use pro to to designate the first segment, meso to designate the second segment, and meta to designate the third segment. In this image you can easily see the pronotum, but the mesonotum and metanotum are hidden by the wings. However, we can see the meso and metapleurons. Insect legs generally consist of five subsegments. From the base to the tip, these segments are coxa, trochanter, femur, tibia, and tarsus. Notice that the tarsus has subunits called tarsomeres. The number of tarsomeres is often used in insect taxonomy. Also note that the thorax has breathing holes called spiracles. Each segment will have a spiracle, but some of these can be lost in certain insects. The abdomen of most insects is usually simple in form and typically consists of segmented top plates called tergites and bottom plates called sternites. The tergites and sternites are usually connected with thin and flexible exoskeleton. Each abdominal segment usually has a spiracle, but the number of these can be reduced in some insects. The tip of the abdomen of some insects has a pair of appendages called cerci. The cerci can be long and antenna-like, or short stubs as seen here in the grasshopper. Many insects have complicated external reproductive organs. Females may have elaborate ovipositors that are used to deposit eggs. The males will have external claspers that are used to join with the female during mating. While simple in external form, the abdomen usually contains most of the organs of digestion, excretion, and reproduction. In order to give you a different perspective of the grasshopper anatomy, let's take a look at this dorsal, or top looking down, view of a grasshopper illustration. The intact grasshopper is figured on the left and the parts have been pulled apart on the right. You can now see the segments that make up the head, thorax, and abdomen. In this enlarged view of the expanded grasshopper illustration, you can quickly see that there are lots of terms that are used for all the parts. Again, on the head we see the antennae, compound eyes, and mouth parts. Notice the three nota of the thorax, the pronotum, mesonotum, and metanotum. We can now see where the legs and wings fit onto these segments. The abdomen illustration only shows the tergites. In this illustration, we have a female that has a spine-like ovipositor visible. Most insects have conspicuous compound eyes that are able to form a mosaic-like image. Each compound eye is made up of a grouping of individual facets, each of which detect light. Compound eyes are not as acute in vision as our eyes, but this form is very good at detecting motion. We will cover the details of compound eyes in a later lecture. Most insects also have a set of simple eyes that are called ocelli. These are not able to form an image but can detect light and dark. Some insect larvae do not have compound eyes, but they possess lateral, ocelli-like light receptors that are called stomata. In these illustrations, we can see different ocelli and stomata arrangements. The stink bug has only two dorsal lateral ocelli. The cicada has two dorsal lateral ocelli and a median ocellus. The caterpillar has a grouping of ocelli called stomata that are where compound eyes would normally be. 
because of the arrangement of this stomata, caterpillars can detect gross movements in their environment. Insects have one pair of antennae. The antennae often have stretch receptors along the bases, or they may have long hairs also attached to stretch receptors. These can detect movement or airflow. Such receptors are generally called mechanoreceptors. Most antennae also are equipped with an array of chemoreceptors. These generally detect airborne chemicals and would be the equivalent of our ability to smell. Insect antennae consist of three basic units. The scape, or base, a pedicel, and the flagellum. The flagellum often has numerous subsegments that are called flagellomeres. Because each insect has different needs for detecting vibrations and odors, insect antennae are often highly modified. There are many forms that insect antennae can take, and we don't expect you to memorize all these forms. Usually these are illustrated in entomology books and taxonomic keys. The basic form was probably a simple rod which is called filiform. Many insect antennae end in some kind of swelling or knob. This can be an abrupt club, capitate, a gradually increasing club, clavate, or a club consisting of flat plates, lamellate. Some insects have the first or second segments elongated, then there is a distinctive elbow bend followed by the rest of the segments. This, this type of antenna is called elbowed or geniculate. Filiform antennae with each segment flattened down into a saw-like form is called serrate. If some of the antennal segments have long projections, the antennae is called pectinate or feather-like. Antennae covered with long hairs are called plumose. Most adult and immature insects retain the chewing mandibulate mouth parts as were illustrated in our grasshopper. However, some orders of insects, especially the true bugs and bug-like insects, have the mouth parts modified to pierce tissues and suck up liquids. We'll look at some of these modifications. Several groups of insects have modified their mandibulate mouth parts into structures that are more adept at ingesting liquids. In these insects, some of the mouth parts have been extremely elongated into stylets that can pierce plant or animal tissues. These stylets are usually encased by a wrap around labium. In these illustrations of the piercing sucking mouth parts of a true bug, you can see in the cross section drawing that the mandibles surround the maxillae, which are joined together to form a salivary channel and a food canal. The mandible can move back and forth to punch a hole into tissues and the maxillary stylets follow them into the hole. The labium is able to fold out of the way as the mandibular and maxillary stylets move deeper into the tissues. Mosquitoes also have piercing sucking mouth parts, but you can see that the mandibulate mouth parts used are different. In this case, the labrum is curved around to form the food channel. The bottom of this structure is sealed with the mandibles, the hypopharynx, remember that's the floor of the mouth itself, and the maxillae. The hypopharynx contains a salivary channel. When mosquitoes feed, they move both the mandibulary and maxillary stylets in and out in a stabbing motion. This cuts a hole into the skin and the labrum and hypopharynx follow. Salivary secretions keep the blood from clotting and most also have a numbing agent in the saliva. Again, the labium folds back as the stylets move in to the tissues. While regular chewing and piercing sucking mouth parts are the two most common types discussed, some insects have even more modifications. Many butterflies and moths have the maxillae elongated and joined to form a siphoning organ, that is, 
a flexible tube. This is often called the proboscis. If you have seen a fly feed, it appears that there is this pad-like structure that is dabbing onto the surface of the food. This is a sponging type mouth part. Honeybees and other bees have the labium elongated into a structure adapted for lapping up nectar from flowers. They keep the mandibles for chewing, so their mouth parts are actually called chewing lapping type. And some insects, like thrips, have one mandible reduced and the other is used to rasp the surface tissues of plants that cause the cell juices to surface where they can be sucked up. Insect mouthparts are often highly modified to serve the functions needed by the particular insect. In the butterflies and moths, the mandibles and maxillae are lost and the floor of the mouth, the hypopharynx, has been elongated into an extensible coiled tube. This is used to siphon fluids. Many flies have mouthparts modified into an extendable structure that ends in a sponging pad. This is used to dab up fluids. Many of the hymenoptera, bees and wasps, retain their mandibles in order to chew wax, solid foods, and make paper, but they have the maxillae and labium elongated into a lapping organ suitable for picking up liquids like nectar. Weevils have a rather strange modification of the front of the head. It is generally elongated into a prominent snout-like structure. When you look at the tip of this, when you look at the tip of this snout, rather normal looking chewing mandibles are present. So, what may look like a sucking modification is actually a modified chewing structure. Now let's move to the modifications found in the insect thorax. Remember that all insects have three original segments that make up the thoracic tagmatum. The prothorax, mesothorax, and metathorax. If we look at a cross section of an insect thoracic box, we can see that there are basically four sides. The top plate is called a nodum, nota for plural. The side plates are called pleurons, or pleura, for plural, and the ventral plate is called the sternite, or sterna, for plural. Remember that the basic insect leg has five segments. Other arthropods can have more segments or fewer. In the insect, the five segments seen are the coxa, trochanter, femur, tibia, and tarsus. The coxa is the segment that allows for rotation of the leg with the thoracic box. The trochanter is usually present, but some insects have lost the external evidence of the trochanter. The femur is usually the largest segment and contains the main flexor muscles that are used for jumping and running by extending and retracting the tibia. The tibia is usually more slender and this contains the muscles that can flex the tarsus and tarsal claws and pads. The tarsus consists of one to five tarsomeres or sub-segments. The tarsi are often fitted with pads, hairs, and sense organs. Depending on the insect's habits, the legs are often modified for specific purposes. Raptorial or grasping legs are found in, an, in a praying mantid and are used to grab and hold prey. The lice have special modifications of the tarsi to hold on to host hairs and are called clinching. Many insects jump and this often requires enlargement of the femur of the hind leg. Swimming insects often have the leg segment streamlined and flattened in areas to serve as paddles. Many of the bees have special hair patches on their tibias for holding pollen collected from flowers. Most adult insects have two pairs of wings. The forewings are located on the mesothorax and the hind wings are located on the metathorax. There is a general trend to join the wings or use only one pair to power flight. 
This increases the efficiency of the flight. The true flies have only the forewings functioning with the hind wings reduced to short balancing organs called halteers. Many parasitic insects, including the true lice and fleas, have secondarily lost the wings in the adult stage. Other species of insects that don't really need to fly may have reduced or short wings. Insect wings can be membranous or cellophane-like, thickened, in other words leathery or shell-like, or the wings can be covered with scales or hairs. In this illustration, you can see the diversity that can occur in insect wings. Unfortunately, these illustrations are not of relative size, but you can still see the various shapes, forms, and venation. Many orders of insects have diagnostic features in their wings. For example, notice that the bug wing has a half thickened base, the hem elytra, and a membranous tip. Beetles have the forewing modified into a hard shell-like structure called the elytron, or elytra for plural. Notice that the thrips wings are very narrow and stick-shaped and are covered with long hairs. Insect wings have thickened veins, which are not like our veins, but these veins often contain tracheal trunks, that is breathing tubes, nerves, and they are hollow so that the blood can flow from the insect body into the wings and back again. Entomologists believe that there was likely one major development of the wings of insects and this yields major similarities in the wing venation. By viewing the insect nymphal wing pads and pupal wing pads, it becomes evident that insect wing veins have similar origins. The veins finally present in the wing are named according to the, these origins and these names are generally consistent across most of the orders. If we take a closer look at the front wings of a fly and a butterfly, we can see how the veins have been modified in form, but the vein names are derived from an original template. In the fly, notice that some veins are joined or lost, while in the butterfly, some veins are branched and retained. Finally, we move to the last insect tagmatum, the abdomen. Entomologists that have studied many insects and insect embryos find that the original insect abdomen likely consists of 10 or 11 original segments. Each segment typically has a pair of spiracles or holes that lead to the trachea and air tubes that run throughout the interior of the body. As previously stated, the abdomen generally contains the organs of digestion, excretion, fat storage, and the reproductive organs. The testes are usually attached to male genitalia and there is a copulatory apparatus called an ediagus. Females often have modifications of the last abdominal segments that are used to lay eggs, the ovipositor. Many insects have a pair of short to long antenna-like structures called cerci. Aphids have alarm tubes called cornicles, and caterpillars and sawflies have fleshy prolegs on their abdominal segments. In this diagram of a generalized female insect abdomen, you can see the cerci, there are a pair of these, and the spiracles, again a pair on each side of the abdominal segments. You can also see the external female organs are rather complicated structures. The insect abdomen is usually divided into three regions. The top region is usually thickened and is called the tergum and the individual segmented plates are called tergites. The lower thickened region is the sternum and the individual plates are called sternites. Between these two shell-like areas is a thinner, more flexible zone called the pleural membrane. Different insects can have the abdomen modified for the needs of the particular insect. 
The mayfly naiad has finger-like tracheal gills attached to each abdominal segment. And the adult has no such structures on those abdominal segments, but you can see that it has a pair of very long cerci and a median, and often a median caudal filament. The earwigs have forcep-shaped cerci. The wasp has an elongated ovipositor and a sheath that protects it. Now let's move into the interior of the insect body. We will only go through the major parts here and discuss the functions of the internal organs in later lectures on digestion, excretion, respiration, circulation, reproduction, and the integument. The insect digestive system consists of three major sections, the foregut, midgut, and hindgut. We try to make these complicated terms. The foregut and hindgut regions are lined with cuticle, the same material that makes up the exoskeleton. Because of this, the lining is shed during molting, and because cuticle is virtually impervious to movement of water and or nutrients, there is no absorption in these regions. Therefore, only the midgut can secrete digestive enzymes and absorb digested nutrients. Each region of the insect gut can be highly modified according to the foods eaten by any particular insect. Obviously, a termite that eats wood fibers will have a very different gut than a mosquito that feeds on blood. The foregut is primarily a holding area for recently ingested food. This would be called a crop. There is a muscular area at the end of the crop that acts as a secondary grinding organ, and this is called the proventriculus. This functions like the gizzard of a bird. The midgut often has accessory pouches that are used to hold food while digestive enzymes do their work. These are usually called gastric cecae. The midgut is only one cell layer thick, so it is often lined by a cuticulin-like material that is secreted to keep the abrasive food particles from poking a hole in the midgut cells. This is called the paratrophic membrane. Where the midgut joins to the hindgut, there are a set of tubes, the malpigian tubules, that remove nitrogenous waste from the body and dispose of these in the gut stream. The hindgut usually has rectal pads that remove excess water from the undigested waste before elimination of the feces. Here are two diagrams of very different guts, one of a caterpillar and the other of a milkweed bug. The caterpillar eats leaves and the milkweed bug sucks liquid sap from seeds and milkweed plants. Notice that the caterpillar has a long straight gut with the midgut being the longest segment. This is to absorb nutrients from the leaves that are eaten. But the caterpillars are not capable of digesting the cellulose, so copious fecal pellets are produced. The milkweed bug has an enlarged crop to hold the liquid foods. In order to get rid of all the excess water, the midgut is looped around to form a kind of water shunt. The water is removed to the hindgut and excreted as liquid droplets and the concentrated remainder is further digested and absorbed in the midgut. As mentioned before, each insect has a gut designed to process whatever foods the insect eats. Nymphs and their adults will have very similar guts, but larvae may have very different guts than the adult forms. In these illustrations, the first one is of an antlion. Antlions capture other insects and suck out their body fluids. So the antlion larva has a very large crop that can hold substantial amounts of ingested foods. The next one is a ground beetle. Ground beetles are mainly predators, so the gut remains relatively simple, except for the little finger-shaped cecae of the midgut which are designed to rapidly absorb nutrients obtained from another insect. The caterpillar has an elongate midgut which we have already discussed. 
Grasshoppers also eat lots of plant leaves, but they have large sechi to aid in the digestion of that plant material. The columbulin gut is very simple with all three sections remaining as simple tubes. You will learn later that excretion actually consists of two processes. Egestion is the elimination of undigested waste. The egested product is usually called feces. Egestion is the opposite end of ingestion. Other excretory needs are the elimination of toxic or unneeded metabolic byproducts. This usually includes the nitrogenous waste associated with metabolism of proteins and amino acids. When proteins are metabolized in the cells, ammonia is produced. This is a highly volatile gas that is quickly transformed into urea in our bodies. Urea is water soluble and low in toxicity. It is what makes our urine yellow. Since insects need to conserve water, they further transform urea into uric acid. This is a white water insoluble molecule and is what you see as the white material in bird droppings. Uric acid is deposited into the food stream by the Malpighian tubules and excreted with the fecal, fecal pellets during egestion. Insects respire by using a system of tubes, the trachea. These trachea deliver oxygen and eliminate carbon dioxide. The trachea are lined with cuticle and the major trunks have to be removed during the molting process. The tubes are highly interconnected along the length of the body. We believe that in the original insect there were paired openings to the outside in each segment except for the head. These are called spiracles. There is a general trend to lose some of these spiracles in some insects. As an example, maggots have only one pair of anterior spiracles, a pair of elongated tracheal trunks, and a pair of posterior spiracles. Even so, most insects have three pairs of thoracic spiracles and nine to ten abdominal spiracles. This is a canna lily butterfly larva that lives inside rolled up canna lily leaves. So it has lost all the pigments that would normally be found in a caterpillar. This allows us to see the major tracheal trunks and the fine divisions of the trachea that eventually go down to the cellular level. The spiracles on each segment can be independently opened and closed. This can adjust airflow in the body. Air can come in the posterior spiracles and be pushed out the front, and then the reverse can happen. In this close-up, you can see even finer detail of the spiracles and tracheal system. You can see a lateral tracheal trunk that connects the spiracles, and dorsal and ventral tracheal trunks that service those regions of the caterpillar abdomen. We are used to having a highly centralized nervous system with a dorsal nerve cord that serves as a conduit to transfer messages to and from our brains. Insects have a pair of ventral nerve cords and ganglia located in each segment. Each segmental ganglia can operate rather independently of the other ganglia or the brain. In the insect head, there are two brain-like structures. The major sensory and coordinating ganglia, which some people call the true brain, rests just above the esophagus. Another major ganglion that operates the mouth parts is found just below the esophagus. The bodies of decapitated insects can often walk, even fly, which illustrates the independent nature of the segmental ganglia. In this illustration of the nervous system of a caterpillar, we can see the nature of the segmental ganglia in a rather original state. If we look at the honeybee nervous system, we would see the brain and three thoracic ganglia, but all of the ganglia of the abdomen would have migrated forward into a single mass. Notice that the caterpillar brain is actually pretty complicated with numerous lobes and connectives. Each of these lobes can be modified for each insect group. 
Many people tend to forget the muscular system. Insects have only one kind of muscle that is striated. Striated muscles react and contract quickly. In general, muscles connect one segment to another which allows for body movements. Other muscles are attached to the various appendages, antennae, mouth parts, legs, and wings, and etc. We'll discuss the muscles in detail later on. The vast majority of insects are bisexual. Biologically, this means that they have males and females. There are many modifications of insect sex organs depending on the types of eggs being produced. Some insects have lost their need for males by reproducing through parthenogenesis. Female insects have ovaries that produce eggs, oviducts that put a shell on the eggs, and a holding organ, the spermatheca, that holds sperm that they have received from the male. The sperms fertilize the eggs after the egg shells are applied. Males have testes, accessory glands, and often storage places for the sperm. The integumentary system in humans refers to our skin. In insects, and all arthropods, the integumentary system makes, maintains, and replaces the exoskeleton. We will find that this is a rather complicated system that is formed, expanded, hardened, then over 90% of it is dissolved and replaced during the molting process.